Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Voigt. I'm a part of the print media program here at PNCA. We would like to begin. PNCA recognizes and honors the indigenous peoples of this region on whose lands the school now stands. These include the Willamette Tumwater, Clackamas, Kathlamet, Malala, Multnomah, and Watlala Chinook peoples, and the Tualatin Kalapuya, who today are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, and many other native communities who made their homes along the Columbia River. We recognize that Portland today is a community of many diverse native peoples who continue to live and work here. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities, past, present, future, and are committed to practices and policies that center indigenous knowledge, creativity, resilience, and resistance. We would like to introduce Deborah Friedman. Deborah Friedman is a painter and printmaker. Selected venues include the Brooklyn Museum of Art, Artist Space, AIR, the Cooper Hewitt Museum of Design, the Kaohsiung Museum of Fine Arts in Hong Kong, Albright Knox Gallery, and Rutgers University. Gallery exhibits include the Painting Center, IPCNY, Lori Bookstein Fine Art, Susan Ely Fine Art NYC, and Hudson, New York, Site Brooklyn. The West Strand Gallery, Kingston, New York, Wham, the Lockwood Gallery, the Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop. It is included in corporate and private collections, including the New York Public Library, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Rutgers University, NASA, the Library of Con Congress, Montefiore Hospital, Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital, and the US Department of State. Um, Deborah Friedman has a solo exhibit running currently at Susan Ely Fine Art New York City. Friedman studied at NYU with Knox Martin, Audrey Flack, James Wines, and Robert Blackburn. She was a McDonnell or McDowell Colony Fellow and guest artist at the printmaking workshop. In 2012, she was commissioned as artist in residence to create a suite of monoprints for the FDR Four Freedoms Park on Roosevelt Island. Her monoprints are included in Singular and Serial, Contemporary Monotype and Monoprint by Catherine Kernan, E. Ashley Rooney, Laura G. Einstein, and Janice C. Orisman. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me? Is this good? So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself before I show you some images. Um, I'm, I'm from the other coast. <laughs> I'm, I'm a new, I was born in New York. My parents were New Yorkers. My grandparents were New Yorkers, immigrants from Romania and Poland. So I grew up in a very urban, uh, wonderful environment. My parents were liberal. Democrats who love jazz and art. So I, I was very lucky as a child. I was actually, I went to the Museum of Modern Art Children's School. There used to be a children's school on 54th Street. And uh, I have this crazy memory of my mother. I was about this big, of my mother standing and, and, and me talking to the woman who ran the program. And she said, we can't give you Debbie's art. We have to show it to the board. And it took me 40 years to realize what a board was. I thought she was talking about a piece of wood. So <laughs> uh, I was very lucky. I was very lucky that I was exposed to painting and, and jazz and art you know, as a very young person. So I went to NYU and studied with Robert Blackburn, who I'm going to show you. So, and Matthew is very familiar, and he can tell you more about Bob. I think that would be great. Um, I just have to find my mouse, sorry. So, so Robert Blackburn was an iconic uh, teacher and artist and, and printmaker. And we called him the angel. He was like the art angel of printmaking. And um, he was a Harlem Renaissance guy. He came from Harlem. He, he went to Dewitt Clinton High School, and he started printing and making, and making his own work and then printing with Rauschenberg. He, he made the famous broken plate print with Rauschenberg at Gemini. And then he, when I studied with him, he taught at Cooper, he, he taught at NYU. 
and I, I think Pratt. Um, and he just did it for us. He just said, you guys got to make prints. This is what it is. And it never left me. I mean, that was, that was something that just he, he, he imparted all of us. And then he started a workshop that he would just let anybody, and I mean anybody, come to work from all over the world. Um, so about 20 years after I graduated NYU, having studied with him, I got commissioned to do some prints. And he said, come on, come on, come on. So I brought him some paintings that I was doing, because I was not printing. I was making waterfall. I was making paintings, because I have a house in upstate New York, which you'll see in the video. And the printer uh, at the shop told me what to do. She said, you're going to make three plates, hard ground, soft ground, and aqua tint, or soft ground. And we just we dissected the waterfall. We basically took it apart. So I had three plates. and. It was practically a psychedelic experience for me because suddenly I was taking apart the structure, the texture, the, the architecture of a waterfall. And I made 100 prints. I made 150 prints, you know, over a period of time. And they got a lot of, they just, they became, accept, they became very, people like them. So, Ever since then, I've been making prints. And my paintings and my prints don't look that different anymore. It's not like I'm making prints about my paintings and vice versa. Because the way I paint is, has become, the, the way I apply paint has become very much the way I apply paint uh, or ink in, a, in making a, um, a print. So I'm just going to show you some things that have inspired me, um, things I look at. Um, so I love Courbet. I love Courbet. Um, can we make it bigger, or is that just, huh? Yeah. Uh, no. Well, I did, but let's see. It's okay. So I love Courbet for a lot of reasons, but also because he used palette knife, and the way he applied paint was very rough and uh, very sexy and and very uh, uh, aggressive. You know, he just was a, he was a fabulous painter. And let's see, this one. Oh. That's another. So I, I, was, I told you I was painting waterfalls. So uh, there's a, and a lot of what I, what I was doing when I first, I got this house in upstate New York in the late 80s, the early 90s. And I started studying the Hudson River School painters a lot because there I was in the, in the Hudson River. So Thomas Cole and Bierstadt and all those people um, really, really influenced me. Then recently I went to the Clark Museum to see the uh, Edward Munch show. And you'll see in a minute why these, these are woodcuts that he did. So Munch was a, we all know his famous scream, but he was an amazing printmaker. And he did variations on, these are two woodcuts that are the same plates, and he made a lot of variations. So that's the thing that turns me on the most, is, is taking an idea or a matrix or a structure or a concept and making different versions of it. So I just, I think Munk is fantastic. And uh, there's another Munk that I just saw. And I had just made, you'll see, you'll see, I had just made an image of a person with it, holding their head in their hands and also a woman in the water. And I had never seen these prints. I also love the early 20th century American landscape painters, Marston Hartley. It's another sort of Courbet-ish kind of image with a very rough hand and uh, Um, the love, the, I just, the, the landscape is what is my most, uh, oh, what happened? Okay, hold on. Remind me later, okay. Can you see it? Yeah. So Dove did a lot of watercolors. He painted in Maine, he painted in, in New Mexico. Uh, looks a little like what I did today, right, Matthew? <laughs> Yeah. Then um, there's some contemporary artists that I love. 
Kylie Staver and uh, Thomas no uh, Janice Nowinski. These are these two images appeared together, so I thought I'd show them to you. Um, Kyle Staver is doing some very almost surreal landscapes. I'm sorry you can't see that it's bigger. I don't know. Show me. Yeah, remind me later. You should be able to click up here. You see that part? This one? That one. This part? No, no. Well, well, all right. That's at least you can see it better, huh? Well, it's better. Anyway, these are two artists to, to, to you can note. Uh, Janice Lewinsky is making, on the right, is making these very awkward figure, figure paintings that are, people just love them. We, and, and artists love her. And, and I had only just begun putting the figure in my work recently. So I'm very attracted to the fact that she's painting sort of bad paintings. You know, like bad, no, she's not. Oh, now how do I get out of this? Now I have to go back to my, okay. Wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm just going to go to my mouse. Sorry. My mouse disappeared. Yeah, I know, but I... See, I can't, I can't hear what you're saying, so come and help me. <laughs> oh, you mean up here? Let's try the arrow right here. Yeah. Oh, it's the, there you go. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. But I need to know what it is. Code. This is Jennifer Coates. So she, thank you. You did? Yeah, but how am I going to go back to the next one? The arrow right here. Bottom. See those two? Oh, yeah. all right. To the left and the right. Not left one and the right one together. Okay. And then you have your inside. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So Jennifer Coates is another artist I'm really watching a lot. She has a lot of fantasy and a lot of color, and she's adding a lot of texture, and it's, it's mostly landscape, and then she, she throws in a lot of her, her fantasy, you know. She's, and, and then she, ha she put a figure with the trees. This is Amy Silman, who I'm sure you all know about. And Amy is making figurative abstract art. And she's so daring, and she's so dear. And, and th this show is a, a show she had uh, two years ago. What you, can, what you can see is a flower painting in the middle. So she, during the pandemic, she was painting a flower every morning uh, on a watercolor. And then when she had her show, um, she insisted that she show the, the small flowers with the big paintings. But the paintings are not flowers, obviously. But um, Amy is so inventive and so bright, and she writes a lot about art. She's a, a really a brilliant woman. And, and then I, these, are, these are part of the shows she had where she just put these large paper pieces on the wall. So they're considered figurative abstract paintings, but they're really, the figure is, it's a little like Susan Rothenberg. It's a, there's a reference to the figure. So there's Deborah. So this is an etching I did as part of a, a portfolio that was produced of figurative uh, etchings by the New York Etcher Society. And this is done 10 years ago. We had a model on a hot August afternoon. And I did this piece called, Who Do You Think You Are, Picasso? It's my Picasso. Um, and I recently went back to it because I decided to include the figure in my my artwork and my paintings and my printmaking. So that has aqua tint, spit bite, uh, and spit bite. So the other person I studied with at NYU was Audrey Flack, who's this, a photorealist artist. She, she was painting abstract paintings because uh, she went to Cooper in the early 50s with Milton Glaser and a lot of Philip Perlstein was her contemporary. And she had a disabled child. And she started um, using photographs um, at, at night. She, she was just using Polaroids to make paintings and because she couldn't really go out much. She didn't have a studio. And then she started using uh, 
airbrush and so on, and it just, the whole thing exploded. She became one of the photorealists. So this is a painting she did called Royal Flush. And um, so in honor of Audrey, who, who taught, so Audrey Flack taught anatomy at NYU. And she had studied with a man named Edward Beverly Hale, who, who, was, who taught at the Art Students League. And he did something called the point system, where you would literally learn the space between here and here, you know, the eye and the eyebrow, and then to the nose. And we would learn the point system. We did 15 second poses, 30 second poses, 60, se you know, 60 second poses, one, et cetera, et cetera. And she taught me how to draw. She taught me how to see. So because I, and we're friends, she's 92 years old. So because I had never put the figure in my work all this time, she's been following me and being very supportive. When I did this new print edition with Marina Ancona, who is a wonderful printer in the summer, I decided to call it Royal Flush for Audrey Flack. So that's why I showed you the Royal Flush painting. So these are, the plate is 20 by 16, the paper is 30 by 22. And uh, I cut out uh, the figure on a, in a stencil. And also, Audrey did a lot of work with angels. So I, and so that's another one. And here is what I did today and yesterday with Matthew, is I'm drawing with a Q-tip into the plate with a, ink, you know, so the white is the paper, obviously. So one of them is the Picasso girl, and the other one is another uh, the two, two from the Picasso series. So this, is, this video is prior to the figure being in the work. But I thought I'd show it to you because it's a lot about uh, what I do. For me, it's an eye. <laughs> it's as if there's a creature under the ground, embedded, and there's an eye looking up at the sky. It has a, a border, and then it has an exit spot, which is a, the source. You know, the water comes in, comes out. And, and in, in terms of a painting, I always include that notch where that is because even though it's contained it's of course not contained it's a living thing so the water comes in and out and it's also the same idea as the Navajo rug where there's always a spot where the energy can come out and I always think de Kooning did that too that there's a something about an exit I don't I don't have a favorite color I um I, I have been pushing myself to um, like white more. For some reason, I've had, I feel like I've had a, for some reason, I feel like I've had a prejudice against white. Just, I think more about a commitment to leaving things alone and having a white space. It's not so much a color. It's just an emptiness. So I've been... I've been using white more. But you know, I really love phthalo green, you know. I love I love <laughs> I love phthalo green and I love turquoise. I love I love the greens and blues for sure. But then there's, you know, crimson red, so I also use these guys for years. These are these um, these foam beveled brushes that uh, I used to buy by the box in a hardware store in Soho when they were, we still had hardware stores in Soho. <laughs> and the guy on West Broadway used to tell me, every time I bought them, he'd say, Frank Stella buys these by the dozen because they have a beveled edge. Once that guy went out of business, I knew Soho was never going to be the same. My studio in Kerhonkson um, belonged to George McNeil. His house and studio belonged to George McNeil, who was a very well-loved Abex painter. And ever since I walked into that studio, I saw the blue paint on the driveway, and 
I said, oh my, somebody lived, somebody. I didn't know it was him when I came here. And then there was blue paint on the driveway. And, uh, and then I walked into the studio and there was all this stuff there that was George McNeil, 145 Waverly Avenue. And, and I knew his paintings, I'd never studied with him. But since then, I've really had the legacy of, of his energy. There's still paint in there. I mean, I got rid of a lot of stuff, but I still have things that belong to him. I had his apron. So yeah, so, so this studio has affected me a lot. This is my studio chair. I'm allowed to get paint on it. And it rocks a little, it's just nice. The thing that I just love about Yupo is I could take away, eliminate, as opposed to when you're doing a watercolor or acry acrylic, you have to add. You can't, you can't take away because the paper is absorbent, so you just can't. So Yupo has this plastic quality and I also tilt everything. I just always tilt everything part of my vision. I don't see, you know, my eyes don't work together. I'm not a realist painter, you know. And the trees are definitely becoming people. Figures. Standing there. I've always hoped that the observer of my work would feel what I'm observing, which is the wonder of nature. Stop, stop. <laughs> uh, if I go into it, I'm going to screw it up. I would you know, be happy if somebody looked at it and said, she's really, she's really interesting. She's really interested in what she's doing and it's inspired. I think I, that's what I think I'd like people to feel that why is this person doing this their whole life, you know? And it must be something about, in a way, honoring the pond. Okay, so there's a couple more images. Oh. Uh, so uh, the other edition I did this summer was I, I put the figure. Uh, I put the figure in a pond. In a in a. This, this is a print with Akua ink. This is this is the water-based ink on rice paper. But I worked with an artist named Catherine Kiernan who lives in Boston. And she's a, uh, she's, a, she's a master printer, but she also is an amazing artist. And she only works with Akua because she doesn't want any solvents you know, in her studio. She won't even let us use paper towels. She's very, yeah. So this is one of the, those. Uh, so this is also 16 by 20. And then on Kozo, and then she mounted it on white paper. And that's it. I guess the paintings did. It's, it's okay. The paintings of the pond. So um, that's me. Does anybody want to ask me anything? You'll have to use a mic because you know my. Because I don't hear well. Prior to painting or, or printing the uh, the pond, what? Why is what? Prior to yeah. to uh, painting or printing the pond. Yeah. Like what was um, something else that like kept your interest? Well, I think there was a shot in the studio. There was a waterfall. Yeah. There was a waterfall painting. So, I I've either painted water vertically. 
okay. or horizontally. So okay. when I first got this, well, I, when I was a young artist I, at NYU, I studied uh, in fabric design. We had a, a professor who taught us how to do marbleizing. So we had a, a, a ba uh, you know, like a, um, a basting dish, what do you call it? You know, like a, a pan with water and oil paint. And we made little, I made little marbleized things. And as soon as I did it, I took the paper and went like that and made a horizon line. And I made, I made a series of eight and a half by 11 paintings of water, on water. And then when I got my first studio, I got a children's swimming pool from FAO Schwartz, you know, a, big, a children's plastic swimming pool. And I made collages with oil paint, with marbled papers that I was cutting up. So it's always been either on water or about water. And they were totally abstract. Well, they were not totally abstract. They were abstract textures, but they were landscapes. And then when I got this house, I got into, I sort of went back to the 19th century and started you know, making more figurative waterfalls, basically. And then during COVID, I made very abstract, horizontal, abstract painting. Thank you. So Thank you. You're welcome. Do you want to talk about your partner in the studio oh, and yeah. the prints? So and Matthew, so, yes, yeah, sorry. So Bob Blackburn, as I said, Bob Blackburn, um, he had this printmaking studio, and I got commissioned to do a, a, a screen of very large prints, uh, eight, eight by 10 foot screen of eight aqua tents, and I needed a printer. So I went to the printmaking workshop and Bob introduced me to Marjorie Van Dyke, who was a master printer. So she became my printer. And then when the workshop closed, she started her own shop. And we became very good friends and she's a wonderful printer. And one day she said to me, you know, the, the little office next door to here is gonna get, is gonna be available. Do you wanna do something? Like invite artists to come and work with us? I was like, sure. So we basically started a business with not knowing anything about business. But that me that's kind of how we modeled ourselves on Bob, because he didn't know anything about he, you couldn't talk about money with Bob at all. He was an old left wing guy. He just was impossible and lovely because of that. So we started asking friends to work with us, and we called Van Deb Editions, and that's how Matthew and I met. She's, her name is Marjorie Van Dyke, and my name is Deborah. So we became the Van Debutantes, is what our friends call us. So that's 20 years ago. So we've worked with over 50 artists. And in the beginning, we just paid for everything. We were totally, totally fools, you know, because she was painting Rembrandt, so I was painting uh, backdrops for fashion shoots. The way I supported myself as an artist for 20 five years was I worked in home furnishings. I did, I worked in, I did sets for shower curtains and fabric. There were things, there was, there was work like that in the 80s and the 90s. And then I did huge sort of fake Rothko's for fashion, for fashion photography. It was really fun. And I made money, it was nice. So that's how we supported, she was doing Rembrandts and I was doing backdrops. So we just, and then we suddenly said, wait a minute, you know, we gotta start co-publishing. So that's what we do now. We work with artists who wanna work with us and if we sell something, the artist gets half and it's kind of, it's good. And we both try our best. We don't work at it full time, obviously. But I think the thing that's interesting about the printmaking and the printmaking world is it's a community of fantastic people. And it's not the art world. It's not the art world. It's, a, it's, a, it's really, people really care about each other. I, I feel that, I feel that way. And people share information. Because if you make a print, my, my experience with working with people like Matthew and Marjorie and Marina and Kona, and I work with Sue Omi and Steamboat Springs, is that you collaborate and you increase the vocabulary of your work. And, and all the artists we work with, most of them have not made a print mostly since they were in school. So it, it gets them out of their studio and, it, and it's, we don't, we, they don't bring things in to replicate. 
They, they bring things in to experiment. So I find the printmaking world very wholesome and, and uh, I, I, it's, kept me more, kept, it's kept me positive, frankly, because the art world is not, the, you know, the art world, the gallery world, and the, it's, pretty, it's pretty hard. And they still don't show women. I mean, it's ridiculous. The percentage of, of you know, it's not, it really hasn't changed very much. But I find the printmaking world more democratic. Have you dabbled in other forms of printmaking, like woodblock carving or screen printing? I have not made a woodblock since, since uh, school. So that's maybe, I'm a devoted monoprinter. Yeah. I, I, love, I love to make monoprints. I mean, just what we did the last two days, I have never done this particular sequence of doing a roll up and then you know, working into the roll, you know, is that what we call it? A tint, you know. I've just, I just uh, haven't done that. So, in a way, we're doing something new. We also made some laser-cut trees, which we'll see how they, how they. That's something new. So I'm, I'm a woodblock carver, and I've actually never done a mono print. So oh. you're making me want to dabble. How would you suggest well, starting? Well, you, you should look up Catherine Kiernan, K-E-R-N-A-N. She makes woodblock monotypes. So she makes these enormous blocks. And overprints and overprints and overprints. They're amazing prints. And she does them on Kozo, on rice paper. Is she the one from Boston you mentioned? She's from Boston. Okay, yeah. I'm from Boston as well. Oh, so, so do you know her name at all? She's, uh, she has a studio with Jane Goldman um, in, uh, I'm forgetting that. I'm forgetting the, uh, I can, I can, get, I can get you the information. Yeah, I go to It's some not Mix It. It might be Mix areas. It. Okay. Studio. Yeah. Somerville? Okay. She's in Somerville. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And she does workshops. Yeah, so, I'll have to look into it. That'd be nice. Okay. I live here now, but I'm from Boston. You what? I live here now in yeah, Portland, okay. but I'm, You're I'm from, from there, so, you know. Always fun. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. So for the the video that you showed, you are like painting on the Yupo paper. Uh-huh. And I'm just curious, like, is that... Do you then transfer that onto paper, or is that? No, no. no. Upo is so Upo is polypropylene. Mm. It's it's recycled plastic, and it's not paper. And I don't really understand why it does what it does, but I can use oil paint on it. I have some in the studio if you want to see before I leave. I brought some with me. You can see them. I have. You can use oil paint on Upo, and you can use acrylic on Upo. And you, what I'm doing there is using Derwent watercolor pencils. And I found out that when I'm, you saw, when I'm painting, actually when I saw the video, I said, God, I should have left that alone. <laughs> you know, uh, I, could, I could work with the pencil at the same time that I'm painting and the, it doesn't take the pencil away. I don't understand why it does this, but I love that surface. And it's like working on a plexi, it's like working on a plexi plate for a monoprint. <laughs> It's like making a painting, but it's a monoprint. Because I, I can wipe it away and add, you know, take away and add until, it's, until it dries. Is that um, like different from the monoprints? Like is that, or is, the, is that a different process? So well, I can't hear your question. Is it a different process for monoprinting? Or yeah, because in a monoprint, then you're transferring it to paper. Okay. And then you get the opposite image and you're putting it through the press. This is just, this is just remaining a painting. Okay. Okay, I get it now. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's just that the way I apply the paint is so similar to the way I apply ink. So I like it better than working on canvas or linen. It's flat. Smooth. So working with both um, the monoprints and then your paintings as well, it sounds like a very similar process. Are there different feelings that like come up in the different forms? Say, if you're, like, say it again. Say it again. Hold the mic closer. Sorry. That's okay. Um, working in monoprints versus paintings, are there different feelings that come up working in those two different 
forms or are they just a, a separate way of tackling the same concept and issue? Is the feeling different? That's mm -hmm. a question? Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> I don't think the feeling is different. Mm -hmm. I think the difference is I'm alone in the studio when I'm painting, and I'm, I'm attempting to make something that has some meaning and some form that's, that's interesting. And, I, and in, in monoprinting, I'm doing the same thing. It's just that I'm not, I'm, I've got this printer over there going, uh, um, you know, like, are you ready yet? You know, no, I'm, kid I'm kidding. <laughs> no, the feeling is not different. The process is totally different. And I and I I I, I love monoprinting more, frankly. I I like having like lots of things happening at the same time. I do work on more than one painting at a time. That's a great studio. I got very lucky. I mean, it's just unbelievable because we my my late husband and I drove up to that house. It was a fixer upper. It was a super fixer upper, but it had a studio. And I saw blue paint on the driveway and I said an abstract painter lived here and then when I walked in I saw all this stuff from George McNeil whom I knew his, I knew his work but I'd never studied with him many people I knew studied with him at Pratt and the studio school <clears throat> so I inherited his apron and I inherited his uh, his hat and a whole bunch of stuff they left a whole bunch of stuff there and he he didn't you know he was a completely abstract painter so and he was very short so the studio, it's basically a garage that he built. The studio had windows all the way around the top. It didn't have a painting wall. And a, a couple of people who were my neighbors, Jake Berthold was one and Tom, Tom Ruskowski, both of whom have passed away, said, Deborah, you need a painting wall. So take the two windows that are there and move them down there and then give yourself a painting wall. He also had garage doors because he painted outside on the, on the driveway. So I had this wonderful sort of... Uh, legacy of, of him in my, in my life. It's been quite, and I used to dream, when I first got the house, I used to dream about him, that he gave me um, uh, drawing like uh, projects to do. I had a dream that he, that he gave me a still life with a, a, a head and a vase or something, and I told Jake Berthold that, and he said, Deborah, that's what he used to do at Skowhegan. <laughs> so I had a little thing with George McNeil. <laughs> Okay? Any other questions? All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much.